Hi everyone, in this video we're going to talk about the outcomes of collisions between spheres. We're going to consider spheres with arbitrary masses and arbitrary initial velocities, and we're going to consider both elastic and inelastic collisions by allowing there to be a coefficient of restitution between the spheres, which is somewhere in between 0 and 1. So the key parameters of the problem are illustrated on the diagram that I've sketched out. You can see that the two spheres have masses of m1 and m2, and before they collide, they're moving with initial velocities u1 and u2. It's a non-head-on collision in general, and so u1 and u2 are going in just arbitrary directions. Then they collide, and afterwards, of course, they've still got the same masses, but their velocities have changed to v1 and v2, and we want to find v1 and v2 in terms of all of the other stuff, m1, m2, u1, u2, and the coefficient of restitution, which I've called e. Now, the first thing I'd like to do is actually transform into a different frame of reference. Now, this is not a strictly necessary step, but it just makes the maths work out much more easily. Specifically, we're going to transform into the zero momentum frame, which, as the name implies, is just the frame in which the total momentum of our system is always zero. Now, why is that a useful property? Well, it means that if you only have two particles or two spheres as we have here, then in the zero momentum frame, their velocities will always be collinear. In other words, either they'll be moving towards each other along the same straight line or moving away from each other along the same straight line, because if they're not, well, then the total momentum can't possibly add up to zero. Now, in order to make this transformation from the original frame, which is usually called the lab frame to the zero momentum frame, course, all you have to do is figure out the velocity at which the zero momentum frame is moving relative to the lab frame and subtract that from all of the uh, velocities of your spheres. So you're going to subtract off what I'm going to call VZM, the velocity of the zero momentum frame itself. It turns out that in the general case, the velocity of the zero momentum frame is given by the total momentum of the system divided by its total mass. In other words, this formula that's just appeared at the bottom there. Since this is a pretty standard result, I'm going to use it without proof for the rest of this video, but maybe I can do another video in the future showing you where it comes from. In terms of notation, I'll just point out that when I transformed from the lab frame to the zero momentum frame, all I did was added a little dash to all of the velocity so u1 became u1 dash or u1 prime similarly for u2 and for the v's as well of course so the dash just indicates that we're measuring that velocity in the zero momentum frame now the next key realization we need to make is well this which is just saying that when the spheres are in contact with each other during that infinitesimally short um, moment of the collision um, there's a force acting between the spheres if the spheres are smooth that contact force is going to be acting in the normal direction and by normal direction i mean the vector that goes from the center of one sphere to the center of the other sphere like that let me just label that as n and give it a hat because we're going to normalize it and give it unit length now why is that actually the case well if there were a component of the contact force perpendicular to that n vector it would be acting um, sort of along the local direction of the surfaces of the two spheres and therefore by definition it would be a frictional force and you don't have a frictional force if the spheres are smooth. Now for the rest of this video we're going to assume that spheres are smooth and therefore that the contact force does indeed act in the n direction simply because if you do want to deal with rough spheres the problem very quickly becomes a lot more complicated not least because the spheres will start rotating uh, after the collision. Now how do we know what the n vector actually is? Well notice that it's just taking you from the center of the second sphere to the center of the first sphere. You could define it the other way around but I just happen to have chosen this particular convention. Um, and so if you knew the position vectors of the two spheres, you could write that n is just uh, r1 minus r2, where r1 and r2 are the position vectors of the centers of the spheres, um, divided by its own modulus to, um, to normalize it. So we can't avoid actually introducing the position vectors um, at the time of collision as extra parameters um, in our solution because it's the relative position of the two spheres that determines the direction in which they push each other. So currently, what can we actually say about the final velocities v1 dash and v2 dash? Let's focus on v1 dash in the first instance. Now, because we're saying that the contact force acts in the normal direction, the implication of that is that the component of the velocities of both spheres after the collision in the direction which is perpendicular to n, in other words, in the tangential direction, is completely unchanged by the collision because there's no force in that direction. So what we're going to do is basically say that v1 dash is the same tangential part of the velocity that we had before, plus some new normal component of the velocity. Now, how can we write down the original tangential velocity? Well, we could take our u1 dash vector and subtract off the normal part because the full velocity is the sum of the normal part and the tangential part. So if we take away the normal part, we're just left with the tangential part, right? So I'm going to do u1 dash minus the component of u1 dash 
in the n direction multiplied by the n vector. Now to complete this expression, all we need is to add on some new normal component of the velocity. Now we don't know what that new normal component actually is yet, but what we can certainly do is express it as v1 dash dotted with the n vector multiplied by the n vector. And so our next goal is going to be to figure out what this v1 dash dot n actually is. Of course, you'd also have a very similar expression for v2 dash, but let's just focus our attention on v1 dash first. Now, one constraint on v1 dash comes from the coefficient of restitution. So let's start thinking about how to get this e involved. Coefficient of restitution, by definition, is the speed of separation over the speed of approach. And when we talk about speed of separation and speed of approach, we're specifically referring to the relative speeds of the two spheres uh, along the normal direction n. We just have to be a little bit careful with our plus and minus signs when we're constructing our expressions for those relative speeds. So start by noticing that after the collision, your velocities v1 dash and v2 dash are pointing in opposite directions. So of course, that just means the objects are moving away from each other. Now, when you've got two objects moving away from each other, the way to find the relative speed between the two objects is to add the speeds together. So you add the speed of one particle going one way to the speed of the other particle going the other way. So what you have to do then is take v1 dash, dot it with n, and then add that to the dot product of v2 dash, not with n, but with minus n, because v2 dash is pointing in the opposite direction to v1 dash. So that's something that could potentially go wrong if you don't think through the signs carefully enough. You've got to have that minus n um, vector dotted with your v2 dash. Now what's going on the bottom of this fraction? Well, you've got to look back at your before condition in the ZMF. Now, of course, the particles uh, were originally moving towards each other. So u1 dash and u2 dash are pointing towards each other. We still want to add the speeds in the n directions, but now we've got to reverse our signs because u2 dash is now pointing in broadly the same direction as n, while u1 dash is now pointing in sort of opposite direction to n. So now on the bottom, u2 dash is the one that's going to get the positive sign, um, while u1 dash uh, is going to have the sign flipped for that direction vector. So then you can, of course, just factor out an n from both the top and the bottom. Uh, the numerator is going to be v1 dash minus v2 dash dotted with the n vector. And on the bottom, uh, it's going to be the other way around, right? You're going to have u2 dash minus u1 dash dotted uh, with n. Okay, so just to keep track of what we've done so far, we have transformed to the zero momentum frame using this VZM velocity. We said that the contact force between the spheres acts in this direction, n, uh, in terms of the uh, relative position vectors of the centers of the two spheres. We said that v1 dash is related to u1 dash by this equation, which came from the tangential velocity uh, being unchanged by the collision. And then we came up with this extra uh, constraint on the velocities um, using the coefficient of restitution. And remember that our current sort of sub goal is to figure out what this v1 dash dot n is so that we can plug it into that equation there. Now, let's just take a moment to look at our coefficient of restitution equation. Think about what's known and what's not known. Now, E is known. It's a specified parameter of the problem. U1 dash and U2 dash were not specified as original parameters of the problem because we were working in the lab frame, not the zero momentum frame. But they're very simply related to U1 and U2, the original velocities. And so we can consider the denominator of that fraction to be known, whereas the numerator we have both v1 dash and v2 dash, we don't know either of them. If we want to solve that coefficient of restitution equation for either v1 dash dot n or v2 dash dot n, we need to know what v1 dash is in terms of v2 dash or the other way around. Fortunately, we can get just such a relationship between v1 dash and v2 dash by considering momentum and making use of this useful property of the zero momentum frame that, well, of course, the total momentum adds up to zero. And so we can say that m1 times v1 dash added to m2 times v2 dash is supposed to give us the zero vector. And then we can just rearrange that to get, for example, v2 dash in terms of v1 dash, v2 dash is going to be minus m1 over m2 times v1 dash. So now you take this expression for v2 dash and substitute it in here uh, in your coefficient of restitution equation. And then the only unknown will be v1 dash. So let's do that. Let's also multiply both sides by the denominator um, to get e uh, multiplied by u2 dash minus u1 dash uh, dotted with the n vector is going to be, well, 
this stuff here, if we substitute v2 dash in terms of v1 dash, there's going to be a common factor um, of v1 dash. So we can factorize that out. We're going to get a 1 from this original v1 dash, and then we're going to get a plus m1 over m2 um, from this thing here. Uh, and that's all going to be multiplied by v1 dash dotted with n. And we're now in a position where we can figure out that v1 dash dotted with n um, just by taking this equation down here, multiplying both sides by m2, and then dividing both sides by m1 plus m2, you conclude that this is equal to m2e uh, into uh, u2 dash minus u1 dash dotted with n, uh, all divided by the sum of the masses m1 plus m2. So now we take this expression that we've just derived, substitute it back into our equation for v1 dash, specifically here, right? Uh, and we'll see what happens. There's going to be a little bit of algebra to get through. So we are going to find that v1 dash is, well, let's keep our u1 dash at the beginning. I'm going to combine these two terms together because they're both uh, a dot product of something with n and then multiplied by the n vector. I'm going to put a plus and then some big brackets because we're going to factor some stuff out. Let's actually deal with this last bit first and substitute that expression up from the, the top right. Um, so we've got m2e times u2 dash minus u1 dash. I'm going to keep the dot n uh, and put it outside the big brackets. So you'll see what I'm going to do with that in a moment. We've still got our over m1 plus m2. Then from this other term in our v1 dash equation, I'm going to just subtract u1 dash. And then that whole thing is going to be dotted with the n vector and then multiplied by the n vector. Maybe that looks a little bit complicated, but ultimately all I've done is substituted one equation into the other in order to eliminate v1 dash dot n and then uh, factorize to combine those final two terms together. So at this point, we know the final velocity of sphere one in the zero momentum frame in terms of the initial velocities of both spheres and the other parameters of the problem. All we have to do now is to transform back into the lab frame. So let's think about how to do that. So how are the primed or dashed velocities related to the uh, undashed velocities? Well, the transformation goes as follows. Uh, the If we want to get back to uh, V1, or let's make it more general and say VI, so that I could be either one or two. VI is simply gonna be the primed velocity um, VI dash plus the zero momentum frame velocity plus v to m. And of course, you're going to have the equivalent relationship for u. So ui is ui um, dash plus the same zero momentum frames uh, velocity. So there are a couple of important implications of this. Firstly, if we want to transform back the lab frame and get v1 instead of v1 dash on the left, all you have to do is add v z m to both sides. And the effect that that will have is to just make this dash disappear and this dash disappear because on the left hand side you're going to have v1 dash plus vzm the right hand side you're going to have u1 dash plus vzm and so effectively we can just get rid of the dashes on those two particular terms so let's start writing this out we're going to have v1 equals u1 plus some stuff that we're going to deal with now now another nice consequence of these transformation laws is that this velocity difference u2 dash minus u1 dash is actually the same as u2 minus u1 without the dashes because the dashed velocities differ from the undashed velocities by a constant offset vzm and so that first term in the big square brackets can just be written as well m2e times u2 minus u1 divided by m1 plus m2 and so the only thing that we have to think a bit more carefully about is the u1 dash um, at the end of that big bracketed term but we have a transformation law this one here that tells us that u1 dash is just u1 minus vzm so why don't we just replace it with that i'm going to need to make a bit more space so i'll write the next part of my equation down here i'm going to subtract um, u1 minus vzm this entire thing is the same as u1 dash then I'm going to close my big brackets and we've still got our dotted with n and um, then multiplied by the n vector. So I've just kept some of the most important results on the screen. Um, our main task now is going to be to simplify this stuff here uh, inside those big square brackets. So remember that vzm is given by this expression up at the top and it has a denominator of m1 plus m2, which is the same as the denominator of this bit here, which I'm just circling. And so it would kind of make sense to rewrite the entire expression inside the brackets as a single fraction with a common denominator of m1 plus m2. So how's that going to work out? Well, the first bit on the numerator will be the same. You'll still have m2e uh, into u2 minus u1. 
since we're putting everything over a denominator of m1 plus m2, this minus u1 is going to have to acquire a coefficient of m1 plus m2. So we're going to subtract off m1 plus m2 into u1. And then we're going to have uh, plus the numerator of vzm plus, because you've got minus and minus, uh, the numerator of vzm was just m1 u1 plus m2 u2. And then we just put all of that over a denominator of m1 plus m2. Fortunately, some of the terms cancel. In particular, you've got this m1 u1, which cancels with the m1 u1 that you would get if you were to expand those brackets. Then you can see that what you're left with is m2 e into u2 minus u1 minus, or no, I'm going to write it as plus, plus m2 into u2 minus u1, where I've combined this and this and factored out the u1. And of course, the denominator is still m1 plus m2. Right, so let's put all of this together into a final expression for b1. b1 equals u1 plus the complicated bit. One other simplification you can make is to notice that this and this are the same other than the factor of e. And so you could write the numerator of that fraction um, as 1 plus e into m2 and then your vector u2 minus u1 but i'm going to save that for uh, just now let's put our denominator of m1 plus uh, m2 there then i'm going to deal with the vector part of that term so as i said you've got that u2 minus u1 uh, relative velocity vector that remember is being dotted with n I'm going to write n in terms of r1 and r2. You've got the definition of n up at the top. So I'm going to put my r1 minus r2 there. We're going to divide by the modulus of r1 minus r2 because we need to normalize it. And then we need to multiply that whole thing by this n here to make it into a vector. So I'm going to have a r1 minus r2, but then I need to divide by its modulus again to make sure it's normalized. So that is going to be squared. So after all that work, we have come up with our expression for v1 in terms of all of the other parameters of the system. Not the smallest expression, but it's ended up looking pretty nice. The only remaining thing to do is figure out what v2 is. Now, there are two ways, I guess, to get v2 dash. One of them would be to use this momentum equation we derived earlier to figure out v2 dash and then transform back into the lab frame again. The easier way would just be to use symmetry um, and notice that, well, there's nothing special about which particle we labeled one, sorry, which sphere we labeled one and which sphere we labeled two at the very beginning. And so if we just take our uh, equation for v1, swap all of the ones and all of the twos around, then that should give us an equation for v2. If you do that, you get that equation that I've just written on the screen, and we're done because we've got our two final velocities in terms of all of the original parameters. So if you've made it this far, congratulations, and thank you for watching, and I will see you soon.